All right, kids, in 1848, a law made it forbidden for a person to appear in public, quote, in a dress not belonging to his or her sex. The law, believed to be one of the first of its kind in America, specifically criminalized any person who shall appear upon any public street or public place in a dress not belonging to his or her sex. Now, this was instituted in my hometown of Columbus, Ohio, and you can find it here under section 10, which prohibits houses of prostitution. This information kind of flies in the face of the video I made around two years ago about how Columbus is LGBTQ friendly, at least more friendly than every other city in Ohio, not very hard to do, let alone around the US. Well, much like how after that Columbus ordinance, more than 40 US cities created similar laws limiting the clothing people were allowed to wear in public in the decades that followed, earlier this year, Tennessee was the first state in the U.S. to officially enact strict limits on drag shows when Governor Bill Lee signed an anti-drag measure into law, HB09 and SB03, in March. The American Civil Liberties Union is currently tracking nearly 500 anti-LGBTQ bills in the U.S., many of which would ban or censor performances like drag shows. However, here's what makes Tennessee's drag bill unique. Bills have gone through now. Therapy. That's on your desk. Uh, drag bill heads back to the Senate for a quick amendment before it hits your desk. Uh, comfortable signing those types of legislation? Yeah, I expect to sign both of them. Remember Josh? Remember dressing in drag in 1977? Right? What a ridiculous, ridiculous remember? question that is. It? Conflating something like that to sexualized entertainment in yeah. front of children, which is, is a very not, serious subject. Drag is not sexual. Andy, what you got? Do you remember it? Is this you? Andy. I'm just wondering if you're aware of any specific cases or instances that this bill would stop. What's, are you aware of specifics in terms of the problem? That this is to I think the, the concern is uh, what's right there in that class, in that building, um, children that are potentially exposed to sexualized entertainment, to obscenity, and we need to make sure that they're not. I think that's something that should happen in Tennessee and it will because of this bill. Bill Lee, the governor of Tennessee, dressed in drag while in high school. This isn't me dragging him for cross-dressing. Many Republican politicians and pundits dress or have dressed in drag. And if you didn't do so yourself, then you have cozied up to someone who has. My thing is, instead of explaining why it's okay when they do it and there's a problem when others do it, as was shown, the excuses made go something like this. It was a long time ago, or, well, I did it as a joke. Maybe even a, yeah, fine, I dress in drag, but I wasn't a drag queen. And like Bill Lee, you have to make drag inherently sexual. Says more about him, to be real. You have to pretend like this form of entertainment is going after kids. Therefore, you must protect the kids with legislation. After all, cross-dressing is obscene, they would say. Never mind the fact that Tennessee already passed obscenity laws, so what's the point of that anti-drag law? You know why, we don't even have to get into it in this video. With that said, in May, along with other anti-LGBTQ legislation, Montana became the first state in the nation to prohibit anyone in drag from reading to children in schools and libraries. The legislation, which went into effect immediately, also prohibits minors from attending drag shows and bans drag performances from occurring on public property where children could be present. Under the statute, minors who attend a drag show or their parents are entitled to bring legal action against performers within 10 years of the event date to seek damages for psychological, emotional, economic, and physical harm. In Minnesota, a bill that would classify drag performances as adult entertainment and place restrictions on where those performances could take place is advancing. As introduced, the bill specifically describes shows in which a performer, quote, exhibits a gender identity that is different from the performer's gender assigned at birth using clothing, makeup, or other accessories that are traditionally worn by members of and are meant to exaggerate the gender identity of the performer's opposite sex. Furthermore, a bill advancing in South Dakota would prohibit the use of state resources from being used to host, quote, lewd or lascivious content defined as depicting any specific anatomical areas or any physical human body activity, whether performed alone or with other persons for the predominant purpose of appealing to a purient interest. 
Man, what? Is what the wait staff at Hooters wearing considered lewd and lascivious? The specific anatomical areas of it all. Cheerleaders dancing at basketball and football games. Is that adult entertainment? Is taking a child to a Broadway show where many actors are wearing wigs and makeup that don't align with their biological gender identity that they were born with now drag shows? Making my way downtown, walking fast. Faces past look like Mrs. Doubtfire and my kids are with me as we see an outdoor play depicting the movie. Did we just attend the performance? Why do I get the feeling that Robin Williams, if he were still with us, would be allowed to read to third graders in school dressed like this? Would that cause psychological and or emotional harm? What is a period interest? Who? When so, seeing how these bills are broad and vague and you can't openly overtly discriminate against drag queens and cross-dressers by law, the script says you have to target presentation, expression, how one dresses. So today we're going to talk about clothes, evidently, because these unjust drag laws focus on apparel and attire, essentially. And as you'll see today, what is and isn't considered men's and women's clothing isn't a matter of fact, but interpretations and enforcement of laws along with culture rights, and customs. We'll get to that first part, laws, a little later, but let's start with culture, rights, and customs. In order to do that, we'll need to get into each other's pants. See, women wearing yoga pants, leggings, low-rise jeans, apple bottoms, and bell bottoms is still a relatively new thing in American history. I mean, it was the unofficial rule on the floor of the U.S. Senate that women weren't supposed to wear pants until 1993. Trousers in these United States were widely deemed to be for men until the 1970s, so women putting on pants a few decades ago was a revolutionary act. For instance, Mary Tyler Moore made it a point to show women not wearing dresses and skirts all the time. In the 1960s, the actress wanted the character she played in The Dick Van Dyke Show to reflect the real lives of American women. However, according to QZ.com, sponsors didn't love the cupping under the pants did on Moore's booty. But she snuck pants into the wardrobe more and more and eventually they became part of her character's look. This Quartz article also showed how a woman going mountain climbing in pants was a big deal and described how a judge ejected a woman from a New York traffic court for wearing pants, telling her to come back properly dressed on a later date. So, Straight, cisgendered white women, even celebrities and starlets, received pushback for wearing pants. However, there are countless accounts of people in queer communities, black, brown, and native people in particular, being fined, placed in prison, or psychiatric institutions based on what they wore. In LGBTQ circles around the country, there was this thing called the Three Article Rule or the Three Peace Law. This has been referenced by people who lived through the arrest in Greenwich Village in the weeks and months leading up to the 1969 Stonewall Riots. According to this rule, trans people had to have three articles of clothing that were associated with their birth assigned gender to avoid getting arrested for cross-dressing. The problem is, though, the law never technically existed per History.com. With that said, how would a cop who is, say, raiding a gay or lesbian bar, deciding on who is or is not cross-dressing, seeing how pants didn't count as women's clothing, what did or does, style of shirt or hat maybe, wigs, makeup, foreshadowing, or were police officers lifting up the skirt of the night, reaching down, feeling around, checking genitals, Bills are introduced today in order to be able to verify one's biological sex this way. And decades ago, police did so as an interpretation and enforcement of what's known as masquerade laws. Before I continue, as we work our way backwards, quote, by the beginning of the 20th century, gender inappropriateness was increasingly considered a sickness and public offense. This was an era in America when pink, light red, was considered a masculine color and associated with boys, and blue was considered feminine and associated with girls. Also, babies, no matter their sex or gender, were no longer being placed in dresses for the sake of convenience. Anyways, a masquerade law, more commonly known as the anti-masking law, dates back to 1845. New York's was one of the oldest masquerade laws. Aha! Other cities were in on this too, not just Columbus. I see you flying under the radar, St. Louis. 
New York declared it a crime to have your face painted, discolored, covered, or concealed, or otherwise disguised while in a road or public highway. The law was originally intended to punish rural farmers who had taken to dressing like Native Americans to fight off tax collectors. Most anti-cross-dressing laws banned public appearance in a dress not belonging to his or her sex or wearing the apparel of the other sex. Although some towns and cities passed laws against indecent dress, or the wearing of disguises instead, anti-cross-dressing laws were typically passed as part of a broader anti-vice campaign that also targeted prostitution, vagrancy, public drunkenness, and disorderly conduct. In other words, period interest, whatever that means. Around that same time, dungarees, or blue jeans, had its origins in America when a Bavarian immigrant by the name of Levi Strauss, who arrived in San Francisco in 1850 during the gold rush, recognizing the miners' need for durable pants, Strauss hired a tailor to make garments out of tent canvas. Later, denim was substituted and copper riveting was added to pocket seams. We may already know this. Here's what you may not know. In the development of this technology and this knowledge in the American South, the film is filled with so many fascinating details, like the fact that denim was marketed at one point as Negro cloth, which I find like, wow, okay. And then I love the story about the Denim Council. Would you tell us about that? Why did they need a Denim Council? Annalie Strachan and Michael Bix, co-writers and directors of the documentary, Riveted, The History of Jeans, told the New York Post that cowboys are frequently credited for being the first Americans to rock dungarees, but that's not really true. Instead, slaves wore jeans and overalls made from denim, aka Negro cloth, because the heavy duty cotton weave could stand up to forced labor. So there's that. With that said, should we claim that blue jeans are black people clothes? Why isn't denim still called Negro cloth? Are we really not basing something like gendered clothing on where they come from, who they're meant for, and origin stories? Because the history of trousers or pants can be traced back to West China some 3,000 to 3,500 years ago, where they found that pants made it easier to ride horses, function over form. Greeks hated pants because, as Vintage News explains, they thought they were ridiculous, but also because they associated them with foreigners. Pants were what Persians, Scythians, and other Asian people wore. They were clothes of barbarians, not a civilized Greek. Greeks may have been under the impression that women invented pants because Central and West Asian women wore them freely. The Romans, of course, followed the Greek attitude on pants and referred to people who wore pants as effeminate. There it is. Look, I've spent a lot more time talking about pants than I thought I would, and I hope you get the point. There's not much of a reason to deem pants or any other article of clothing gendered in any way. These things change. When it comes to culture, rights, and customs of who we're wearing, it's vibes, really. They have little to do with history. In the case of this video, trousers are going to have to be a microcosm of, oh, 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 shoes, too. Time around the 10th century, Persian warriors invent a piece of military technology that allows their cavalry to be much more effective in mounted combat. The invention was high heels. That's right, not only were high heels invented by and for men, they also have one of the manliest origin stories of any piece of modern day fashion. And they became fashion because having a horse was expensive, so it was like a pre-industrial revolution way to flex on the poor. So fast forward to about the end of the 17th century when delegations of Persians are going to different European countries to try to forge relations with them and these European aristocrats are enamored by these masculine Persian men in their high heels. That was friend of the program, What's Good English, explaining how heels were created and they could still be for us, by us, shout out to FUBU, but they aren't until they are. English will go on to point out that lifting shoes raises one heel in order to help when squatting and has something of a platform in the back. And yes, even cowboy boots have high heels. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis knows this. He uses them to be tall enough to see how his bills targeting queer communities and drag shows are doing. What are Republican governors like Lee and DeSantis basing anti-drag legislation on? Personal beliefs? How? Traditional values? When? The Bible? A woman shall not wear a man's clothing, nor shall a man put on a woman's clothing. For whoever does those things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 22.5 this scripture does not dictate what is and is not men's and women's clothing. I read commentary on the passage and it's clear that more emphasis is placed on men not wearing women's clothing than women wearing men's clothing, just like it is today, by the way. 
And not only do we no longer dress like that or like Greeks or Romans, but based on what we now know about the ancient world and where this scripture comes from, different cultures and civilizations saw men and women creating and using wigs, makeup, nail polish, and jewelry for various purposes and reasons, accessories still used today. Just like pants, I'm back on pants again. If this is about intent of attire, there are other laws, bylaws, ordinances, and commands in the Bible talking about how one should cover up and wear their hair and maintain modesty, which are rarely emphasized here in the US today and shouldn't apply to non-Jewish or Christian people. But let an American Arab, Muslim, or Sikh person uphold those same ideas and there's a problem. Why are today's men hesitant to allow other men to wear wigs, makeup, and heels? These men did. Why did yesterday's men want women to look like this while taking care of the kids and cooking? This definitely made housework harder. Style over substance. As we've gotten into each other's pants today, it makes as much sense to ban people from wearing clothes of a different sex or gender as it does to compare drag to cabaret shows or exotic dancers. You would think that Republican politicians or conservative pundits would acknowledge this seeing how they love costumes and dressing in drag themselves and disguising government overreach as protecting kids, but they'll never admit it. Just like they'll never admit who the real groomers and pedophiles are, statistically speaking. There's not much of a reason at all for anyone to have issues with anyone else wearing the clothes, attire, and accessories that they want. And it's up to people like me, a t-shirt, Levi's is my only disguise type dude, to stand up for the freedom and liberty of others. Me, someone who, as a teenager, argued that I wouldn't wear Cheryl Swoops' Nikes because they're for girls but now realizes that this shoe isn't much different than men's signature shoes. Me, who would consider bearing my midriff a la Eddie George and Ezekiel Elliott, go Bucks, I have a smoking hot stomach, but it will take a lot for me to do that. Also, remember kids, abs are more of a product of genetics and diet than exercise. So if you're like me, hot stomach or not, you and me, we can remember the past, we can rebel against unjust laws, resist the idea of gender inappropriateness, and the chosen few, some can even revolt. Example, in 1933, actress Marlene Dietrich caused some problems by showing up to the famous restaurant, The Brown Derby, wearing pants. According to the Los Angeles Times, Robert Cobb, the restaurant's owner, refused to seat her. On witnessing her rejection, a pair of comics, Burt Wheeler and Robert Wolseley, left the restaurant and came back in skirts. It's unclear whether they were allowed in. It would be decades before Cobb lifted his ban on women in pants, the Times said. That Columbus ordinance that I opened this video with? Well, in 1975, the Ohio Supreme Court ruled that this cross-dressing law was unconstitutionally vague due to shifting definitions of men's and women's clothing. People who were harassed and arrested under these laws stood up to them. And finally, earlier this June, as of me writing this, a Tennessee judge who was appointed by former President Donald Trump struck down the Tennessee anti-drag bill, declaring it to be unconstitutional and that it violates freedom of speech protections. Whoever you're wearing, whomever you're wearing, we gonna be all right.